Uh, I'm Carlos Gil, uh, as you can see up there. Uh, and the reason that I'm here is because I've <coughs> published uh, my recent book. Um, and you'll notice that uh, the title of this book uses the word family <coughs> because it is about my family. Some of the members being present in this room here. Uh, and, uh, and I use the word survive because in many ways we survived coming to this country from Mexico because this is a story of immigration, uh, a story of settlement, a story of adaptation, assimilation, <laughs> Uh, the story of coming in as a family group, coming in Mexican, and finally, in the end, becoming American, Mexican-American. So, and so, uh, and then uh, I, uh, in the title, uh, I, I referred to the notion of the American dream. Uh, because in the end, even though we really never really talked about it as we were growing up, uh, but we were in pursuit of the American dream. You know. <clears throat> and uh, so, uh, before I go on, uh, I want to uh, thank uh, UCLA and especially the uh, UCLA Cesar Chavez Department of Chicano Studies for sponsoring uh, my talk, letting me be here. Uh, the Latin American Institute Center for Mexican Studies also. Uh, the Department of History, the Graduate School of Education and Information Studies, Paulo Freire Institute, and the CSRC, which is the Chicano Studies Research Center. And that's and this is the home of the CSRC. And I want to also mention, before we go, um, that uh, in addition to family members that I have, and they make up 50% of the audience here, uh, I have my eldest, Mary, my sister Mary. If you read my book, you'll read about a lot about my sister Mary, especially her earlier memories of when we were growing up. She became a very important informant along with my I, I use the word old folks, my ancestors, who first came from Mexico to the U.S. Uh, I taped them all 35, 36 years ago, uh, and uh, those tapes sat in my uh, uh, in my chest of drawers someplace for that long, almost 30 years, and then I finally got to work on them. And so Mary is uh, one of those informants. Uh, my sister Sally is also one of the informants. Uh, Irene, you weren't an informant. Uh, John, my brother-in-law, is here. And I want to mention also Jim Wilkie. Jim Wilkie was my mentor uh, when I first arrived at UCLA in 1974, three years so around there. Uh, and in fact, his classes on oral history impelled me to begin interviewing. And so all the interviewing that I did were connected to the courses that I was taking from Jim on oral history. And so I say that in the book, uh, but uh, it's an opportunity for, for me to mention that. And I want to mention two uh, the fact that Rafael Rodriguez Castañeda, uh, Dr. Rafael Rodriguez Castañeda from the Metropolitan University of Mexico City is also here. He's visiting Jim and um, he's going to take my book to Mexico to see if anybody's interested in translating it into Spanish. So that'd be good. Because I'm being asked, do you have the, a Spanish language yeah. version? You know, And I keep saying, no, I don't. Yes, there is one. Uh, a Colombian, uh, a Medellin, Colombia website called, um, I'll, the name will come to me, El Cornopio, 
for those of you who use Spanish, El Cornopio is the name of the website. And there you'll see a beautiful version of excerpts of the book in Spanish. Done very lovely. Anyway, so uh, my viejos, these are uh, the key viejos in my family. Uh, beginning with the left-hand side over there, on that uh, uh, on that picture there is my grandmother in the gray coat, Carlota. I was named after her. And then uh, the man with a black hat is her eldest son, uh, Pascual Naranjo. And uh, his younger brother is Miguel Naranjo. And then my mom, there in uh, dressed in dark, is Guadalupe Brambila, uh, not yet married to Gil. Oh, I think she was married already to my dad. And so those are my old folks. Uh, so, uh, so in my book, I call them pioneers. They're the pioneers because they broke away, had a, you know, they went on the immigrant trail, arrived in uh, America, and so they broke all kinds of molds and did things like they had never done before. And so that's one set of the pioneers. And then the other is my dad, my father, who came separately from my mom. And she's holding up Mary. Mary, she's holding when Mary was a little baby. And so, um, uh, uh, my ancestors were like indentured workers. I, I use that phrase because it's an America. We know what, we have an idea, we Americans, of what an indentured uh, worker was. And so that's the closest thing that I can come to a peón acasillado, a peón de la casa, a peón that is born on a plantation, lives and works on a plantation, dies on a plantation. Okay, But technically speaking, thanks to the law, they're not slaves. And that's the only difference, is that they're not ranked as slaves. But basically, they're dependent on the plantation. And so on my mother's side, all of my family were peones acasillados. Okay. And um, uh, one third of the book deals with Mexican history, uh, where they were, where they came from, what they left behind, uh, the uh, trials and tribulations of leaving all of that behind. And I include this photograph, which is not connected to anyone in our family, because I want to get the idea to young people especially uh, of the dress, the shoes, the, the indumentaria of someone like this. This is the way our folks dressed, okay, in those early days. Uh, this guy happens to be a, a merchant. He goes out into the back country selling uh, pots and pans or selling different kinds of things, and he carries everything on his back. Okay, so this is 18, this is Mexico late 1800s, even early 1900s. You still see this kind of thing. It's uh, Mexico of the Porfirian period. Okay? Now these photographs, these marvelous photographs, of course, come from Google. Google Images is just filled with wonderful stuff. And uh, I include this famous photograph of Pancho Villa uh, because these are days of revolution. And so when my parents left or broke away from, uh, from Mexico, they, this, the guys like these on horseback and, and, and everything else, uh, they were basically dominating the country. They were loose and going from here to there. So, if you um, if you read my uh, the early chapters, uh, much of what my family did in order to leave the hacienda is connected to these events of the Great uh, Mexican Revolution, um, from uh, Jim Wilkie's courses and my own reading. I came to appreciate the fact that uh, the Mexican Revolution uh, rivals the Russian Revolution of 1917, which is one of the most important revolutionary moments in world history. Okay, so uh, Pascual was the uh, rebellious uh, son 
uh, uh, my grandmother's rebellious son. Uh, he was hard to fit as a an indentured agricultural worker. He had a hard time with that. He had already, at the age of 15, at the age of 14, he knew how to work uh, pistols, uh, mouser guns, uh, rifles, shotguns. Uh, he could ride horseback. <clears throat> and he said to me many times, I couldn't be a farm worker. I couldn't be an agricultural worker. So I had to leave. And um, so <clears throat> my story is about Pasquale in many ways leading the way, the rest following him later. Uh, and they worked their way across the land. Uh, the women in my family, chambermaids, kitchen helpers, the men in my family, railroad employees. And uh, <clears throat> they stopped in, uh, our hacienda was up in uh, 5,000 feet above sea level, just above Puerto Vallarta. They walked down in about uh, 10 hours, 12 hours and arrived on to what is now Puerto Vallarta. And so they stayed there for a few months. Um, my, our family lord tells us that uh, my grandmother made tortillas on the beach and she sold them on the beach. And my mother uh, worked with some food vendors there and that's how they got by. So they saved enough pennies to go to the next uh, spot on the road, Mazatlan from there to Nogales, and then finally to, up into California. And uh, <clears throat> so the parts of the book uh, are the ones that you see up there. It's uh, the pushes and pulls of the dynamics of migration. Uh, the pushes push people out, the pulls bring people in. And uh, the other part is putting down roots, like I mentioned to you. Uh, I, I felt uh, obligated to then even include some observations about the second and third generation. Uh, and then I have some additional materials, and I'll mention those as we go. So uh, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, Mexico, uh, here's a little map that kind of pinpoints the part in the, uh, the region of the country uh, where we came from. Uh, and it's pointing to the state of Jalisco on, uh, in the West Coast. Um, my first major book uh, written under Jim's uh, supervision, Life in Provincial Mexico, examines that region very thoroughly, very thoroughly. And so <clears throat> this is a little map to kind of indicate uh, to readers more or less the progress that we made uh, up the West Coast. I discovered too, very interestingly, um, that West Coast trade by ship was very, very active, taking uh, agricultural products like from Puerto Vallarta up to Mazatlan, up to, um, uh, up to uh, San Blas, for example, a lot of that trade went on. And along with trade, like tobacco, like uh, corn, like um, uh, flour and all that kind of thing, you had people moving as well. And so that's how my, that's how my uh, family uh, was able to, uh, to go. <clears throat> this is one of the earliest photographs that I have of Puerto Vallarta, uh, known at that time as Puerto Las uh, and uh, it's a very late photograph. This is 1965. Uh, my, uh, my folks came down to Puerto Vallarta in 1913, 14, 15. <laughs> so it was a little village sitting there on the side. Uh, and of course, this is Vallarta today. <clears throat> and they went up to Mazatlan. <clears throat> This is Mazatlan today. This is the earliest photograph that I have of Mazatlan, uh, dated 1854. And notice the humps. The Mazatlan has these humps. Uh, so they're here. See, right? Uh, let's see, I'm going to go back. There's the humps there on a modern 
uh, photograph of Mazatlan, and then here they are again in 1854. And uh, <clears throat> uh, ships used to stop in Mazatlan for water, for fueling, and so on. Uh, Mazatlan was a very important uh, place for my family, especially my mother, because this was the first time that she could dress up like uh, a young woman in a nice dress, wearing uh, uh, jewelry and uh, walking with uh, other young ladies who were not necessarily farm girls, you know. And so they'd walk the malecon, listen to music, and so my mother really became enamored with Mazatlan. Uh, and uh, if it hadn't been for my grandmother, I think my mother would have stayed in Mazatlan. And my, I also write that my uh, uncle Miguel, he got a job. My tío Miguel got a job in the local roundhouse in Mazatlan. And I didn't know what a roundhouse was, but trains come in here, the, the locomotive engine, they come in here, the, it's on a turntable, and the engine is turned around, so the engine can be worked on from different shops along this uh, back area. And so it can be turned, worked on, and then the, the train then shoots out this way, easily, it doesn't have to back up. Uh, and so my tío, Pascu, my tío Miguel worked in a roundhouse, and so I had to go around scouting, looking for photographs of roundhouses, okay? And so the only one I could find was this one in Tyler, Texas. And, uh, but it gives the idea of a roundhouse. One day we were in Mazatlan, my mother and I, maybe with Mary, I'm not sure, but I know that my mom and I went out in a taxi cab because she wanted to go see La Casa de Redonda in Mazatlan, where my uncle had lived. This is about 19, mid 80s or late 80s. And Vigan, her sense of place was very good. And the taxi cab took, took us to this seedy looking kind of area. And we asked some people and they said, yeah, indeed, there was a roundhouse right over there. <laughs> so we found, we found the place that had had the roundhouse. <clears throat> but the point is that <clears throat> is that uh, my, my Tio Miguel uh, told me in, in, in his interviews that he didn't want to leave Mazatlan to go to the United States. There was no reason. He had, a, he had been given a great job moving locomotives and he was only 15 years old or so at that time. Uh, he, better than digging, you know, doing agricultural work. Uh, and so he was in love with his uh, job and he was very proud to wear mesclilla. And uh, uh, that means jean material, uh, jean pants and jean shirt, because those were the clothes of industrial workers in Mexico in the early, late 1910s, early 1920s. And those workers had a certain amount of uh, political weight already in a revolutionary labor worker oriented Mexico. Not the agricultural workers, but this kind of worker. So he was very proud of that. And uh, so uh, they had struggles uh, uh, at home about having to leave Mazatlan. Uh, but my grandmother said, we must have the family come together and we must leave. Uh, one of the surprises that, I, that uh, I discovered was that in that railroad job that my uncle had, uh, the uh, Southern Pacific uh, de Mexico, my grandmother and my uncle and my mom were given a house, a small worker's house on, on, the, on the railroad plantation. This was their first house because previously they had lived in a little adobe shack on the hacienda. So in Mazatlan, in their own home, in, uh, you know, it might have been a company, town kind of place, but it was a big step forward. So this is one of the reasons why my tío Miguel didn't want to leave and my mother didn't want to leave, uh, but they 
finally left. And so they went up to Nogales. And this is an early photograph of Nogales there. Uh, estimate, uh, no, it's hard to tell, 1910, maybe 1912. But it's a photograph of the, uh, uh, of the uh, international boundary. And uh, the photograph is taken right down the middle of the, uh, the boundary line right here. And so here is the little guard house for the, uh, uh, for the guard, the border guards. And we know that my mom and my grandmother uh, applied for immigration papers because I found them in the archives. And so they were given uh, documentation to allow them to pass. So, and they passed through here. And so I describe that passage at the beginning of the book. Uh, and uh, my Tio Miguel had crossed over on the other side. <laughs> he didn't have time to wait. Uh, he didn't want to be weighed down with papers. So he just went around the other side and went over. Okay. Uh, and uh, and note, note that this uh, postcard is identifying dry versus wet, okay? Because uh, Arizona was dry, no liquor. And wet, uh, yes liquor, okay, on the Mexican side. That's what it is. What part of Arizona is that? What part of Arizona is that? Uh, it's uh, Nogales. 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 Right on the border. Okay. Right on the border. Uh, very different from the kind of border that uh, I just looked at uh, just a couple of weeks ago, right? I, I was down in Rosarito, I didn't tell you, Jim. Rosarito, Ensenada, Tecate, all that area, boomed there, it just boomed and grow tremendous. But the border is there, the border is there, it just uh, slices right across. And I, uh, I, I include this photograph in my little talk at this point because it's simply symbolic of the economic dynamic that rules or commands the process of migration between the border. Because basically Mexican workers rushing to fill American jobs. And this is 1954, during the Brasero period. And so these are, these are workers waiting, to, <laughs> look, look at the crowd, look at the crowd, waiting to come across and, uh, and uh, and go to their appointed job, which is most of the time waiting for them already. Okay? And those are the kinds of links that I always talk about, uh, the economic uh, union that the U.S. has with Mexico that brings workers to their jobs, but we put this border across in order to stop the flow for all the political reasons that we know. Okay? So, and so, uh, in my book, I show that when my uncle Pascual reached Tucson, he went from Nogales to Tucson, and almost within a day after arriving in Tucson, somebody came and said, do you want a job? Give me your name, we'll put it on the list. And so he said, yeah, this is my name. And so uh, the, the guys had report to this hotel, and will basically take you, put you on the train, and send you off. My Tio Miguel, when he arrived in Nogales, within hours at the Placita, somebody came up and said, you want a job? Here you are, report to this hotel, and we'll put you on the train, and we'll take you to your job. And that's what happened. When my mom crossed the border into Nogales, my grandma, they too were put on a list right there. They didn't ask for the jobs, they were offered the jobs cotton picking in Tucson, right there, okay? Proof of the economic bonds that we're talking about. That's, uh, they continue to the same. Okay. My mother said we were lousy cotton pickers. <laughs> <laughs> and so then I felt obliged to try to find out because she said we were lousy cotton pickers. We could only pick, uh, I don't know how many pounds per day, she said. I said, well, yeah. How, how can we compare that to good cotton pickers, okay? 
So I went out looking around for good cotton pickers. And I found them in old, in old records for the South. And uh, yeah, we were lousy cotton pickers, that's for sure. <laughs> Absolutely lousy, okay. Uh, Tell them why. Oh, yeah, because you pick cotton and you're, you get all, uh, you bleed. You bleed from the little uh, hard uh, uh, leaves that, uh, that pucker up like that on the cotton ball. So you're trying to get the cotton ball out and you're hitting those sharp, uh, dry leaves. And so the expert cotton pickers avoid that somehow, but the inexpert ones just, so you get bloody fingers all day long. Little detail, little detail. <laughs> and so my family then arrived in Southern California here nearby San Fernando. This is a shot of San Fernando, 1918, <clears throat> uh, and it's instructive because uh, look at all this empty space. And this is, of course, the valley. Um, and uh, <clears throat> uh, I learned uh, that uh, uh, there were a lot of open areas, but a lot of jobs, so that the valley, especially the North Valley here, the San Fernando Valley, changed in terms of major occupations over certain periods of time. And so it went from basically open lands under the missions uh, owned by the uh, uh, religious missionary societies. And then they went to wheat growing. And then they went to uh, 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 fruit garden kind of things. And then eventually to orchards. And then the whole valley filled up uh, as orchards. And then those two went. To other places. Uh, but uh, in the end, uh, San Fernando, 1918, for people who don't know, especially up in Seattle, they don't know where San Fernando is. So I included this photograph and I said, yeah, we're way up there, way up there in the, uh, in the stream of freeways. Uh, and um, the valley looking east from Sepulveda and Rita streets, again, it shows the empty lands at that time. It's incredible to see these kinds of photographs today. Because all this area just filled up with homes and factories and so on. Uh, look at the valley today. This is the kind of scene that you see from as you're flying into Burbank Airport, you know, coming in. So why did my folks settle in San Fernando? They never told me specifically, uh, in part because I didn't always ask the right questions. But I had to come to the conclusion, and in fact, <clears throat> eventually I learned that they settled in San Fernando because in 1927, this is two years before the Great Panic that initiates the Great Depression. So Wall Street just begins to fall apart in 29. This is two years ahead. And so why did they settle in San Fernando? According to our family lore, they settled in San Fernando because citrus jobs exposed you to insecticides and herbicides and people believed at the time that those chemicals brought on tuberculosis. And so a lot of people stayed away from those jobs because you didn't want to catch tuberculosis. And so my mother goes on a lot about uh, the TB. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and my father, just about that time, loses his arm in an industrial accident. So here he is, a physical kind of guy, uh, and he loses his arm. And so, <clears throat> Uh, he has no choice but to go to the most available jobs, and, and they were always connected to citrus, always. So, uh, <clears throat> so ours is a story of toil, of grief, and moments of joy. Uh, <clears throat> I, I tell how we found wage-paying jobs, how we secured a home, uh, 
uh, I describe the barrio of San Fernando because I later learned that the barrio of San Fernando was the first barrio in the valley and San Fernando is the first city in the valley too uh, and uh, within the barrio uh, our family lord uh, our family lore uh, pulled the curtains on a small neighborhood that we in our home called La Vecindad. And La Vecindad simply means neighborhood, kind of like uh, uh, referring to a clutch of houses. And inside this Vecindad were these small buildings, maybe the length of this room here, maybe, maybe a little bit longer, and maybe about the same dimensions but may it was filled with about 10 or 12 little apartments so you came in on this side and here was one room and then there was the other one. and so the building went this long and so here we lived in these little apartments and it turned out that San Fernando had many of these little uh, tiny little apartments uh, and um, and so this is where my sister Mary comes in because she remembers very uh, fondly, in, in many ways, uh, in great detail, the kind of uh, life that children uh, enjoyed, even in very close quarters like a, a little vecindad inside a barrio. Okay? And so I write that in, in the fullest description possible. I've been told many times already, because my book has been batting around, especially in, those, in that part of the valley, that no one has ever seen any kind of description of a barrio the way I've presented it. Especially a vecindad like that. Just doesn't, not out there. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, Gill's Cafe is right there at the, towards the bottom of the list because my father being disabled uh, the way I mentioned his losing an arm we eventually concluded that the only way for our family to stay together was to put together a little eatery a little cafe and so Gill's Cafe became our way of holding on to <laughs> to to, uh, to our survival okay and so that caused a lot of problems within the family because we all had to work, we all had to be part of the effort, and that caused a lot of stress, you know, in addition to everything else that was going on. Uh, and then connecting and celebrating is a chapter that I used, like I mentioned to our guests from Mexico, uh, that uh, these, uh, this is a chapter where I describe how we connected with the rest of the community outside of our home. And so I describe neighborhoods, I describe a, uh, a commercial strip that served our barrio with stores. Unfortunately, a lot of uh, taverns and cantinas and drinking places, uh, and, but all of that was part of our life. So I describe it as best as I possibly can. And right almost close to the cantinas and these drinking holes uh, and so on was the Catholic Church right there in the middle of everything okay so on Sundays you'd have to kind of walk past a few borrachitos you know these drunk guys who had a bad Saturday night and uh, people milling over to church to hear mass you know it's that kind of combination of things that I try to bring into, into that chapter on connecting. And then, in addition to that, here's, here's my family in 1949. And I include this photograph because it's so, the photograph is so revealing of who we were in those years, okay? Look at our clothes. Look at my pants. See the pants that I'm wearing there? Look at my shirt. Look at my sister Sally, rumply clothes there. My sister Emily, rumply clothes. My sister Martha, rumply clothes. But the older members of the family standing there with a certain amount of uh, hopeful affirmation in their faces. 
my dad already worn out when he was only 48 years old, 49. So this photograph reveals so much about the process of trying to survive as immigrants and in an American world. And so to me, it's a, it's a very meaningful photograph. And my mother, in many ways, a very determined woman, as you can tell. In all of the photographs, she comes out a very determined woman. And she was a very determined woman, period. Okay. And uh, in these chapters, I discuss the difficult relations between our mom and her daughters. Uh, I don't know of any other book in Chicano Studies that addresses these widely prevalent experiences. But you talk to people on a personal level and they'll tell you they too had many difficulties. And these are difficulties that come from the cultural conflict between being an American and coming from a provincial Mexican traditional society and then having to raise kids in a, in a secular, freer uh, kind of uh, setting. And so, in my book, we talk about this. My brother's sister, I should mention, in many ways forced me to address these issues. Because originally, I had not thought of doing so. But as I got in more into the story, more into the story, there was a lot of stuff that had to be dealt with. Uh, in these moments of cultural feast, uh, we had many of them because we were a very musically inclined uh, family, very musically inclined. Uh, and um, these two men who are identified there with red uh, arrows are, are um, they're my um, uncles on my mother's side. If you, if I were to show their faces to you in photographs that I don't have, you'd see that they were very Indian looking men. Very dark faced, pockmarked with a lot of uh, uh, smallpox kind of things. Um, from back country, uh, Jalisco, but musicians to the core. And so they brought their music, their instruments, and they played in groups here in Southern California, here in the valley. And so this is an orquesta típica, and I describe those in the book uh, to give you an idea of what an orquesta típica was. There were many, many in, in many communities. And so uh, mandolins and guitars and violins and so on. A uh, very special kind of music. Uh, they were born peones acasillados as well. So this tells you something about the mobility of that kind of uh, of that kind of person in, in Mexico of that time. And then also, kind of to uh, cap this uh, idea of cultural life in our little barrio of San Fernando, is this boys band. So this man who came here, he's sitting down at the bottom there. This is a Mexican musician from Zacatecas. He comes to LA he comes to San Fernando when I was about 13 years old. And I know later that he went to our parish priest and he said, Sir, nobody is taking care of your children here. There are no government programs to do that. Their kids, uh, th these kids are not going to go anywhere. I can make musicians of them. And here's my program if you'll publicize it among your your parish. And so to make it a long story short, my, the parents of that parish agreed. And so as I describe in my book, he whipped us into a Cracker Jack band, playing Mexican compositions, of which there were many and we didn't know at the time, and American compositions. We were award-winning musicians at the age 
of 12, 13, 14, 15. And we were so proud because we had done something that nobody did in our neighborhood. Nobody did. And so uh, uh, the red arrow there is pointing to my kid brother, uh, Rick Enrique, who has since uh, gone on to his glory. Um, but uh, that was us. And so we had a great time. We <clears throat> brought pride to our community <laughs> in many ways. Uh, and uh, representing, again, moments of culture and music and uplifting in many ways. Uh, this is a picture taken us uh, in front of our Gills Cafe on a day of uh, community celebration because there's palm palm leaves there, see the palm leaves, and buntings and ribbons and that kind of thing. And so uh, uh, it gives me an opportunity to identify, here's my brother Mike, this is my mother, here I am, this is my sister Marty, my grandmother already very close to her last days, and then Sally who's here, Rick uh, and my youngest sister Emily, and my Theo, my my Theo Pasquale's <laughs> wife. But this man here is an opportunity for me to to say that our that our cafe in San Fernando catered to braceros. And so, if it hadn't been for braceros, we wouldn't have had much of a customer base. And so they were very important consumers of what we had to offer. And so that's Manuel, if I'm not mistaken, Manuel Becerra. Gonzalez. yeah. He came with his brother and his dad, and we knew them all, lived with them. So we knew, we were part of the glob. Uh, and, <clears throat> and so, uh, interestingly enough, when uh, the Brazil program in many ways creates a lot of illegal immigration. And when that is stopped, our cafe closes. So it's almost coincident with the turning off of the market, <laughs> and then we have to close down our cafe. Although it wasn't the only reason. <clears throat> and so I end with this uh, photograph here because in all this process, uh, we came in as, uh, <coughs> as Mexicans, and us kids then uh, were no longer Mexican. No. I asked several of us, including my sister, I asked Mayel, I asked Sally, I asked myself, at what point did you recognize internally that you were really American. Maybe Mexican, but certainly not Mexican. At what point did you do that? And so I asked them, and their responses were kind of like mine. You know, you really don't know. There's no real moment that comes. It's sort of a growing awareness uh, that, that something has happened all along. Uh, and uh, in my book, I tried to kind of gather all that, all that data that would feed into that process that in the end makes you say, yeah, I'm not, I'm not like my mom and dad. And I don't vote in Mexico anyway, you know. I don't even keep track of Mexican politics, you know. I keep track of this stuff over here. So it's a growing realization. And I include music, I include friends, I include language issues, I include all those kinds of things that in the end make you a very different kind of person. So, <clears throat> so uh, here's Sally sitting here with us. Uh, my brother Mike had already married uh, his uh, first wife, uh, Pat, an Anglo-American lady. And so that was kind of important, uh, unusual in those days. And this was their son, uh, Chris, who became a Marine and then uh, died, uh, unfortunately, from cancer uh, in, in his 30s sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. 
And my brother Rick is he, and then my mother there, sister Mary here, me, and then Emily. You're I Irene. Irene, right? So, <laughs> the second and third generations, I offer this thumbnail bio of them, what they kind of do for their work, just to get an idea of job progression at least. The first generation, the men had these kinds of jobs. So in my book, you can say the second generation, men and women had these kinds of jobs. And then the third generation, the same thing. So try to get at the idea of uh, progression. Even though I think in the end, our family is a very ordinary kind of family within the Mexican American experience. Okay? There are some Mexican-American families, at least in terms of educational achievement, are staggeringly impressive. Not our family. We're kind of ordinary, not in the middle, kind of. Uh, and do we have an understanding of those special families? The answer is no. We don't have any understanding of those special families why they came in, how they're able to develop, we have no understanding in Chicano studies. Okay. The role of business, the role of small businesses in Chicano studies, zero understanding. I might be hit on the head by some of my Chicano studies faculty, colleagues, but I think that's the case. <clears throat> So I offer a story in part four, a uh, story within a story, about a search for my father's origins because he refused to tell us about his past. He was a embittered orphan, I think you can say that fairly enough. And so I had to go around digging out <laughs> and putting stuff together. And finally, in my last chapter in my book, I give a new version uh, why my father left, how he was treated, why he might have been treated that way, and then his uh, arriving in the U.S. <clears throat> what does it all mean? Now this is what it all means. The larger picture, the Gill family within the context of Mexican immigration to the U.S. That's what it is. That's a, the biggest picture. Uh, the Gill family offering a view of what it is to become an American, a hyphenated one. And it's also a collective biography of the family because I interviewed a bunch of people to put something together. Uh, so, and this point here is one that I've been stressing a lot. How ordinary families can also contribute to our understanding of multicultural America. Because most of our focus is on special people, leaders usually, and then in groups it's always maybe unions or organizations, but very seldom families. And then uh, this is more of a personal thing for me. It's a, it's a historical legacy for my kids and my descendants. So they can at least say, well, you know, here's a story, you know, because most everybody else can't do that. And that's it, folks. That's it. That's it. That's it. How about any comments or questions? I have to come over because I um deaf. That's <laughs> <laughs> um, Besides oral histories, what other forms of research did you use to get Besides oral history, history, what other forms of research did I do? Well, if you look at my book, it's studded with uh, sources. So um, I use primary sources. I, for example, uh, immigration records. I use... Uh, birth certificates. I went into Mexico originally many, many years ago to do a lot of local digging. Uh, case uh, court records and uh, 
uh, death records, all that kind of stuff. So I use some of that in this book. And then um, on top of that, a lot of genealogical sources. The Mormon archive, for example, was very important to me because it discovered on my father's side uh, connection uncles that my dad had had that we never heard about. Okay? And so, so those archives I've used a lot. And the internet provided me lots of information. So I very carefully identify everything that I used. So in addition to oral history, then this other stuff, and then a lot of secondary material. And so you can see the secondary works that I've used all the way through. So it's a, it's a regular mix of, of historical sourcing, I would, I would call it. What I found so interesting was when I read about your mother uh, going through the usual growing pains of the possible boyfriend and being torn away from that and the yearning to just have a good time and yet, be a young woman. Yeah. And yet was so astringent with her own daughters, you, you feel that she she went through that herself, but why didn't she give a little bit understanding her daughters? <laughs> and she had and had yeah. many. Yeah. Right. That's a did very good question. Did I... she ever share anything like why she felt she had to be so uh, strict? strict? Did she marry? <laughs> well, uh, uh, my theory, my theory, my theory is this: that in an American setting, which was unfamiliar to her to begin with, in a language that she didn't uh, control, sending Mary and uh, the rest of us to schools that were new to her huge institutions in comparison to the little school where she went. This was exposing them, this is my theory, exposing them into a, a setting that she, over which she lost control for the moral security of her children. That's my theory. Uh, and then on top of that, where did we live? We lived in the barrio. That included a lot of single guys who were drinking, a lot of that kind of stuff as well. Especially when we lived right on the strip, yeah. right on Callister Street. We were a block and a half away from these awfully Cigars. smelling cantinas. You know what I'm talking about. I think that added to... That's my hypothesis anyway. Yes, sir. Uh, I have, I, I never comment. I'm always a sort of anonymous uh, staff member here at CSRC, but I, I want to thank you for your story. And uh, my own family shares a very similar background, but different East Coast Jewish people who came here from uh, Poland, and they were dirt floor peasants. And uh, your story uh, strikes so many similar chords with me in terms of parental mysteries. My father and his father, there are mysteries that will remain closed. Uh, sad, uh, uh, grief-filled mysteries, horrors that uh, re remain, um, uh, you know, just enigmas uh, as to the whys and the wherefores and who these people were. And I, I admire so much your desire to tell a story about ordinary families. And my family was an ordinary family the mystery of those families that were not ordinary. How was it that they were not ordinary when we all started in such a similar way? Uh, so I just, I want to thank you for having the courage to, and the desire to, to create a record where a record didn't exist. Uh, also, for other reasons, uh, for, for the Jewish people, there are a lot of records that are just cut off, that uh, there was a desire for assimilation, there was a desire to fit in quickly and to leave the past behind as fast as possible. And that leads me to my question, which is, you were saying that even though your family had become a family with, with some substantial members relative to Mexican society in Mexico at the time of your immigration, there was a profound desire to leave the country no matter what. That was by your mother, I think, you were saying. A profound desire to unite the family. Unite the family here. Uh, well, it happened to be here. 
But so the desire was, it happened to be here. So the desire was more to unite the family rather than to leave Mexico. In our case, it was. So leaving Mexico was not the primary goal. Unification was the primary goal. In our goal. case, that's the that conclusion that I draw. Yes, I, I understand yeah, that. That's the conclusion that I draw. And Even though Mexico was in upheaval, right. but still from everything that we know, it was not so much to put your back on that, but to bring us together and then Figure go from out. there. Right. That's a very important it's distinction. An interesting, Thank uh, you. It's an interesting d distinction. Yeah. yeah. What Jim, was the hardest anything? part of the book? Anything? What's that? Uh, I'm asking uh, no, Jim Wilkie. I, I think you're right. No. The opportunity, more schooling. The it was that. there indirectly and never stated in so many terms. Uh, it was there. But there are so many families that saw that very distinctly. We didn't. And the Chicano Studies has to make those decisions. But let me say just a little bit more on that, and then we'll finish. I'm sure we all want to go. Um, I'm uh, recently retired. Uh, I taught mostly Latin American history, but also Mexican American history at the University of Washington. But I'm discovering, that, especially uh, on, the, uh, on the, the roots of my book, coming out now, that a lot of my colleagues in the Mexican-American field who also came in with me with a Ford Foundation grant back in 1970-71, there was one, an important source for us to get into graduate school. There was nothing there before, and that got us in, okay? So a lot of us got in with that Ford Foundation grant. And so the, if you look at Chicano history professors, and Chicano literature professors, or Chicano studies professors. They're my age now, if not a little bit younger, maybe three years younger. So I know that Carlos Cortes from UC Irvine, he recently wrote his own biography, autobiography, which I've already read. Uh, uh, este, uh, uh, Madrid, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Raul Madrid? Raul? Who, who is Raul? Raul? Not Raul Madrid. There's another Madrid from Texas Tech. He also retired recently, and I read his biography. And uh, and so he, my, that's not my biography, but there's a little bit of, of me in that, uh, in that book. But if I look at Cortes and if I look at Madrid, they come from very different kind of uh, family backgrounds than ours. In the case of uh, este Madrid, He's a manito from New Mexico. And they had land, they had cattle. And his grandfather went to school and got a bachelor's degree back in 1920. Wow. Okay? Very different. In the case of Carlos Cortes, he comes from Jewish Mexican background. And on both sides, they're very middle class oriented. And so Carlos had no choice but to go to college very different from us. If uh, I haven't read uh, Rudy Acuna's uh, biography yet, uh, but I'm very interested to find out. I think there's something different there that is very contrasting to what we went through uh, in our own experience. And I think your family is very different too. Very middle class oriented, uh, higher education oriented, and that and that kind of understanding I think is lacking in Chicano studies. We don't know how to explain those things yet, and, and I think we need to do that. Yeah. I think that's all. I what was the hardest it. part oh, of the hold, book? Hold on, Jim Wilkie. What was the hardest part of the book for you? Uh, doing the second part where I try to explain my mother being such a battle axe. <laughs> <laughs> And leaving yourself out. And I don't you don't myself. see Carlos in this book, really. He's the omniscient narrator. <laughs> like a novel, he's overseeing the whole family and putting it all together for you. And it's a tremendous contribution to history and methodology. And methodology, yeah. yeah. So I think this is a good thing to talk to the Fondo in Mexico about. Yes. Fondo de Cultura Económica. But it's been such a pleasure to see all these things I didn't know about you.
I thought I knew him. <laughs> but I didn't know all this. Uh, because you, you, really, you didn't talk about these things. You were always talking about uh, life in the university and uh, your studies and travels. And uh, we were reminiscing at lunch how he left for, he wanted to become a lawyer and he went to Seattle, a Jesuit school in Seattle for his BA and then went for his MA to Georgetown. And he was, but that's when he went, got wound up in the Foreign Service. And then he was sent to Honduras, the government fell. He was sent to Chile, the government fell. <laughs> was he responsible? <laughs> we don't think so. We think it was because those governments are always falling. <laughs> but somewhere along the line, he decided he would better get a PhD. And he went to Ohio State, where I was, and I interviewed you, and you just said, you'd come to Ohio State. But I was in the process, soon I was in the process of moving to UCLA. I was only there three years at Ohio State, and I've been here now 45 years. Wow. And you then spent a year there and then moved out here. And we were uh, very pleased that you did. Great scholar in the book on Mascota is a kind of a collective history of the town of Mascota, Jalisco, where you come up with composite characters. How do you talk, tackle a town of a, a historical town that had five or six thousand people when it started out? Maybe if that, with the records you were looking at over time of the early 20th century, um, and you're trying to show the life of the sort of business, small businessman, the life of the the bakers and the butchers and the uh, candlestick makers, everything that makes a small town go around. And the agricultural life, uh, a, that's a tremendous book. A tremendously exciting book. And that's a way to understand the small... Mexico went through a series of small books like that, of looking at the little community t communities, uh, micro-histories they were called. Uh, maybe it's time that they look at his other book on... Uh, Mexico, which is the uh, uh, mascota world left behind, where you spent a year at least on research and then went back for another year and took the kids and the family and kept going back and forth between mascota. You provided the continuing link. I don't know how many of the rest of the family have gone back and forth, but it's tremendous uh, initiative and tremendous vision of knowing where you, not only your family fits in, but the collective history of Mascota. So, uh, publishing that book, on, uh, which was your MA, which your PhD thesis, uh, and drawing upon all of your travels from through academia, you knew how to write by then. Your BA, your MA, you were always writing. You obviously didn't want to become a lawyer after a while. Everybody wanted to be a storefront lawyer in those days. <laughs> yes, they never, never saw what a storefront was. They were going to be a, level, a lawyer for the common person. They're still saying that, but nobody believes them anymore. That's right. <laughs> they want to get, become a lawyer and have five cars and seven Jeeps and a house in Malibu and, you know, and charge thousands of dollars an hour. You've been able to put this all together and retain your uh, integrity uh, as a scholar. And uh, not many people can do that, and continuing to do it. And this is after you've retired, you bring this book out. So it's not like you're publishing or perishing. You're always publishing and always interested. And this is a, exciting to see, and I want to congratulate you. Thank you, Jim. Again. <laughs> Thank you for coming, and it's great to see all of the family together here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim.